Well, welcome everybody. It's welcome. great to have you here. And I'm Diana Cummings, if some of you might not know that. I wanted to introduce to you Christopher Klein, and you can tell him more about the Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I know the winter has been a little bit harsh this year, so uh, this will be a nice chance to get a preview of the Harbor Islands, a great place to go this summer. And if you've never been out there before, hopefully this will uh, spur you on to get out there. The ferries will start up, I believe, in about three or four weeks. Usually it's the first weekend of May that the ferries start going out uh, to the islands. So just to see, how many of you have been out to the Harbor Islands at least one time in your life? Okay, so a good number of you. Um, I grew up in Andover, mm -hmm. uh, so not far from here, and to me, the Harbor Islands might as well have been the other side of the world. I went to Australia twice before I ever set foot on one of the <laughs> Boston Harbor <laughs> Islands. It's just not fun of mine when we're, you know, uh, growing up here uh, north of Boston. But it was a fantastic uh, <coughs> research project learning about the Harbor Islands for the book I wrote, Discovering the Boston Harbor Islands. And what I found what was really unique about the Harbor Islands is that you would think that maybe after the 7th or 8th, ninth Island, they start to blend together. But each island really has its own distinct personality, its own stories to tell, its own interesting cast of characters. And I, the, the book is organized island by island, and I like to think of it really as 34 separate short stories because it's really the way the islands are with their own interesting character to them. But in writing the book, I did find three themes that seem to keep coming up time and again. And the first is that Boston, uh, the Harbor Islands, really are Boston's hidden treasures. And we refer to them as the hidden shores in the subtitle of the book. And there really is no other city in the country that has this incredible resource so close to the mm -hmm. downtown area where you can board a boat and in 15 minutes you've left the hustle and bustle of the downtown streets behind for... Uh, open skies, surrounded by water, uh, these are public parks. So you will find other cities in the country that have islands close to downtown, but they've been turned over for residential development or for other uses. So it really is an incredible resource and a unique one that we have with these harbor islands. The second theme is that the um, harbor islands are prisms through which we can view the history of Boston and America. And if you just stop to think of what an incredible front row seat that these islands have had to some of the seminal moments in American history, even going back to just a few months after the Pilgrims land in Plymouth Harbor, Miles Standish leads a small band of Pilgrims uh, up to trade with some of the local Native American tribes, spends a night out on Thompson Island. When the Puritans arrive in 1630, the Harbor Islands are the first piece of Boston that they see as they settle down to their new home into the colonial period when, of course, the Tea Party happens out in the harbor and the islands are the scene of a number of skirmishes that we will see and when the British troops finally evacuate Boston, it's by these islands that they sail out of the city. And then to the 1800s when the great clipper ships are built in East Boston and set sail to rule the global trade lanes and when the immigrant experience in America really starts to take off, the harbor islands are oftentimes the first piece of American soil that new immigrants to this land are going to see or set foot on. And then the Civil War, the men of Boston train out on these islands before they go off to the battlefields of the South. So a lot of the stories that we're going to talk about tonight are some of the real seminal moments in American history. And then the third theme is that Boston would not be the city that it is today without these harbor islands. So in a very literal sense, these islands were used to build John Winthrop's city upon a hill. When the Puritans arrived, the islands looked very different than they do today. So they were very heavily wooded. The Puritans cut down the trees from its shores. They used it for timber to build their houses, to build their wharves. And they actually converted some of the, the uh, islands over to farmland, which they used to grow crops to feed the nascent colony. And then in a more fader sense, these islands offer the protection that creates a safe and commodious harbor that is protected from enemy attack and also protected from the fury of any storms out in the Atlantic that allows Boston to have this harbor that really is the lifeblood of the, uh, of the city itself. So let me just turn down some of these lights here to try to get a little better view. Oh, oh that's there much better. There we go. What a beautiful sunset. All right. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about some of the primary ways that Bostonians have been using these harbor islands really for 
centuries since the Puritans first arrived. And the primary use of these harbor islands, really up until recent history, has been in terms of military fortification. So the first fort goes up on Castle Island back in 1634, back when Castle Island actually was an island out in the middle of the harbor. And uh, fort had been in active military use on one island or another right up through the Second World War. And even into the Cold War, there were Nike missile silos out on Long Island and on what is now Webb Memorial State Park connected to uh, connected to Weymouth. So even into the Cold War, these islands are being used for military purposes. So one of the stories that I tell in the book is about a little known event called the Grape Island Alarm. And we all learn in our history books about the American Revolution, that the first battle were fought at Lexington and Concord in April 1775, and then you had the Battle of Bunker Hill in June of 1775, but we never really learned too much of what was going on in those couple months in between. And what was happening was that the British are holed up in Boston, they're under siege, uh, the Patriots have blocked the one way in and out of Boston by the narrow isthmus that connects the uh, city of Boston to the mainland, but they are still able to move their ships around the harbor. And back in colonial times, again, the Harbor Islands are used much differently than they are today. So there are a number of farms out on these Harbor Islands, which make them important strategic targets for both the Patriots and for the British. So you will see a number of skirmishes happening during 1775 out on the Boston Harbor Islands. And one of them occurred on Grape Island, which was a little island right off the coast of Weymouth, May 21st, 1775. And Grape Island is owned by a man named Elijah Levitt. He was a loyalist living in Hingham, and he got word to the British that they were welcome to come out to the island and take whatever supplies that they needed. So on that morning, uh, four British ships set sail for Grape Island to get the supplies off the island. Now, of course, back in 1775, we didn't have radio, TV, internet to sort of spread the word. You had to rely on word of mouth. And if anyone ever played the old telephone game when they were a kid, you know that word of mouth isn't always the most reliable way to spread information. <laughs> so uh, rumors started flying that the South Shore was under a full-scale invasion. And we know that because we have a first-hand account of the confusion of that morning from this woman, Abigail Adams. And if any of you ever read the David McCulloch biography of John Adams or maybe saw the HBO miniseries, you know that um, John and Abigail Adams are constantly writing letters back and forth to each other. And in the summer of 1775, John is with the Continental Congress down in Philadelphia. Abigail's in the Salt Box House and what is now Quincy was Braintree at the time. And so she wrote to John Adams about uh, what was going on that morning of the Great Island Alarm. And this is what she wrote in her letter <coughs> to him. She said that when I rose about six o'clock, I was told that the drums had been sometime beating and that three alarm guns were fired, that Weymouth Bell had been ringing, I immediately sent off an express to know the occasion and found the whole town in confusion. The report were that 300 British had landed and were upon their march into town. The alarm flew like lightning and men from all parts came flocking down until 2,000 were collected. You inquire me who were at the engagement at Grape Island. I may say with truth that all Weymouth, Braintree, Hingham, all who were able to bear arms and hundreds from other towns within 20, 30, and 40 miles of Weymouth were there. So. The good news for the Patriots when they show up at the shoreline is they are not under a full-scale invasion. The bad news is the tide's out, so they can't get their boats immediately into the water, and their small gunfire can't reach the island. Eventually, they're able to launch their boats, they get over to Grape Island, and saw, as soon as the British see them coming, they hightail it back to Boston with a few tons of hay that they've taken from Elijah Levitt's farm. Now the Patriots are ready to get their revenge against Elijah Levitt for being a turncoat for the Redcoats. They take his livestock off the island, they burn down his barns on the farm, and then they're ready to go to his place in Hingham. So word gets back to Elijah Levitt that he's got an angry mob of Patriots heading his way. And according to the Hingham town folklore, he's ready for them. Now with the gun, now with the rifle, he puts out a spread of cheese and crackers, <laughs> some cake, and a barrel of rum. And there are no reports of any gunshots being fired that afternoon at the Levin Estate. So apparently the refreshments did their trick, and that was the end of the Grape Island Alarm. Now if you go out to Grape Island today, you're not going to see any signs of what happened there during 1775. In fact, it's a very bucolic island, probably one of the most untouched islands that you're going to find out on the Harbor Islands. You will be walking 
uh, in the woods, it might think you might think you're somewhere in northern New England. There'd be berry bushes about shoulder height. Uh, you're surrounded by trees. There's wildlife out there, and all of a sudden you might turn a corner and then see the city skyline or an oil tanker going by, and then you know, know where your bearings are. But Grape Island is one of four islands where you can actually camp out overnight. So Grape Island, Bumpkin Island, Lovells Island, and Pettix Island are the four islands that you can camp out on. Now, if you are not much of an outdoors person like I am, uh, they just opened up on Pettix Island uh, specially constructed yurts. These are structures, they have bunk beds, they have electricity uh, in there, so if that's your idea of roughing it like it is for me, then that would be a definite place to check out. But if you're ever interested in camping, be sure to make your reservations early. You can go online to the Boston Harbor Islands website and make your reservation, but they tend to fill up quickly. So you can want to sort of give it a, uh, a head start if you can. Now the island has got its best known use is for military purposes is George's Island. Uh, and George's Island and Spectacle Island are the two islands where they get the most visitor traffic out to. They're the boats that leave directly from the Marriott Long Wharf in Boston, go out to George's Island, one goes there, one goes to Spectacle Island. So those are the two islands that most visitors are going to set foot on. Now, George's Island's claim to fame is that it's home to historic Fort Warren, which was put into operation at the start of the Civil War, was in active military use up through the Second World War. Never fired any shots at any enemy combatants, but its biggest claim to fame was during the Civil War, it was used to house Confederate prisoners of war. Among the most famous prisoners in there were Mason and Slidell, if you recall the Trent Affair uh, from your history books as a kid, uh, and also Alexander Hamilton Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy, was kept inside the prison at Fort Warren as well. Uh, if you go out there today, this brick building was used during the two world wars to store underwater mines, which were put on the floor of Boston Harbor in case any submarines or any enemy uh, craft came into Boston Harbor. And now that it's been transformed into a great museum, which I highly recommend that details the history of Fort Warren and the coastal defenses of Boston. And next to it now is a giant open air structure that uh, is home to a Jasper White summer shack. Uh, so history was made when this opened up because it was the first fry later on the Boston Harbor Islands. So now you can go out, get some nice seafood, uh, have a cool drink, and because it's shaded but open, you can still enjoy the cool breezes and, and, the, uh, and the views uh, from that outpost on George's Island. Now if you go inside to the fort, uh, on a hot day, it's a very cool place to be inside because the walls are made of these enormous blocks of granite, uh, some from Quincy, some from Cape Ann. There's not a lot of windows inside, so it's uh, a dark, damp, cool place in there. If you are a photographer, there's a lot of great interplays of light and angles with some of the archways that are inside, but the, the guts of the fort have basically been stripped down from the time that it was in active military use. So you really won't see too much out there, but just the hulk of the actual fort itself. Uh, but if you go out there uh, later in the afternoon when the sun starts to set and the visitors start to go back to Boston, it can also be a little bit of a spooky place to be hanging around. And that's why George's Island's home to the resident ghost of the Boston Harbor Islands, the Lady in Black. And the story of the Lady in Black was made popular by the historian Edward Rose Snow. And the gist of the story is that there was a Confederate soldier uh, who had just recently married, and he's taken capture on the battlefield down south, but he gets word to his newlywed wife that uh, he appreciated if she would come and try to break him out of the prison. <laughs> so she makes her way up north, and she dresses up in men's clothing in the middle of the night, one night, to try to be as inconspicuous as possible. She uh, brandishes a pistol she tucks underneath her belt, and she gets into a rowboat on the south shore and launches into Boston Harbor. She rows across the harbor, she manages to land on George's Island, she manages to get inside Fort Warren, and she manages to meet up with her husband. That's the good news. The bad news is that the minute she meets up with her husband, she also meets up with the colonel of the fort, Colonel Dimmick. Seeing him, she pulls out her pistol, she aims at the colonel, and she fires off the pistol. Unfortunately, the gun misfires, accidentally kills her husband by mistake. <laughs> and now to make the bad day doubly worse, she's also committed an act of treason against the American government. 
So for her crime, she is immediately condemned to hang from the gallows. Her one request before dying is because she's wearing men's clothing is that she get women's clothing to at least go to her execution. But this is a Union fort in the Civil War. There are no women who are stationed out there. The best they can do is they take some of the black drapes that are hanging up on the windows, and it is said that the lady in black wore those to her death inside Fort Warren. Now, we never like to have history get in the way of a good ghost story, but there are no recorded instances of any Confederate prisoners or Confederate sympathizers being executed inside Fort Warren. Interestingly enough, there were two executions that did happen out of Fort Warren, but these were of Union soldiers who were bounty jumpers. They would sign up for a regiment, take their pay, and then they would go AWOL, sign up for another regiment, get their pay, and do it all over again. These two guys were court-martialed at Fort Warren, they were convicted, and then they were executed by a firing squad. So those two executions, however, were the only ones that we know of out there. In history's favorite of the Lady in Black, however, I did come across a newspaper account from a Gloucester newspaper in 1862 that said that the men on nighttime duty out of Fort Warren were seeing ghostly apparitions of a woman who had recently passed away at the fort. So perhaps the Lady in Black is still out there today. I have not met her yet, so we, we will see in the future. This photograph here is going to show you some of the uh, Union uh, soldiers who were stationed in the fort, and this next photograph is of some of the Confederate prisoners of war. Um, again, I apologize for this being a, a little dark to see, but I think just by the fact that there was a staged photo of Confederate prisoners of war, you can surmise that conditions inside the fort were not exactly like the Hanoi Hilton. Okay? This was not a POW camp that we might think of in the modern sense of warfare. Conditions, in fact, were pretty benign if you were a Confederate prisoner in there. Uh, if you were a wealthy Confederate uh, soldier or an officer, you could arrange for your own food and alcohol to be delivered from Boston right to you. You could get papers delivered right to you. You could congregate with other soldiers outside and have a smoke with them. You could walk along the ramparts. Uh, in fact, in the new museum, there's a great exhibit that shows a dinner table that's set up and it tells you what each person inside the fort would be eating. And you will see that Confederate political prisoners and officers actually ate better than the Union privates who were stationed inside the fort. So it's a real eye-opener at what the conditions were like inside Fort Warren. As the war progressed, uh, the veterans started to grumble about the benign conditions and they started to be tightened on some of the tighten some of the uh, regulations on them, but still, um, Fort Warren was anything but like Andersonville or any of the other POW camps that were run by both the Union and Confederate sides during the, during the Civil War. All right, so if you think that driving around Boston can be a hair-raising experience, you should have been a ship captain trying to get into the city during the 1800s, the 1700s, 1600s, long before you had GPS. Uh, if you were a ship captain, First of all, you had to navigate 34 islands. And then you had hidden shoals, strange currents. You might be arriving in the city for the first time. All you have is an old map on you. If you're coming during the winter time, you might have ice that's forming up on your masts. And to top it all off, there's only one way in and out of Boston Harbor. And that's a navigable channel about 150 yards wide that was appropriately called the Narrows. So it was sort of like trying to thread a needle to get into Boston Harbor, and needless to say, numerous ship captains missed it when they tried to get into Boston Harbor. So the islands have been the scenes of numerous shipwrecks over the centuries, um, and a lot of them have washed up on, were on Lovell's Island, which is right on the east side of the Narrows, that ran right between George's Island and Lovell's mm. Island. So Lovell's Island is the scene of numerous shipwrecks, uh, but for this reason, because it was so hazardous to shipping to try to get into Boston Harbor, another primary use of the islands over the centuries has been in terms of navigational aid. So you have range lights, lighthouses that are all constructed out on the harbor islands. The first huts of refuge in the country are placed out on Lovell's Island, just shacks with basic supplies so if anyone had a shipwreck, uh, they could at least survive the night before they could be rescued the next day. These huts of refuge, the organization that it put together was actually the forerunner of the present U.S. Coast Guard system. Um, but the navigational beacon that's most famous out on the Harbor Islands is this one here, Boston Light out on Little Brewster Island. And it was first built in 1716. 
And when Boston Light was built in 1716, we don't really think of lighthouses as being technological marvels, uh, but they really were for today. In fact, it's about 50 years before the next lighthouse is built in North America. That's how far ahead of the time Boston Light was. And the reason it was built was because the merchants of Boston paid for it, and they knew they had to put something out there to uh, protect the shipping because their commercial interests were at risk. Because again, Boston Harbor is the lifeblood of the city. So if you go out to Little Brewster Island today, you can actually go visit the lighthouse. It is on a postcard perfect mm -hmm. postage stamp of an island, about an acre in size. There are special boat tours that leave from Boston on weekends during the summer. And they'll take you out to the island. You can have an hour to explore. If you are lucky, the current lightkeeper of the island might be there and she dresses up in colonial clothing and waves a handkerchief as the boat comes into shore and she'll guide you around the island. And we're fortunate to have a lightkeeper out on the island because of its historic nature as being the location of the first lighthouse in the country, we have a resident lightkeeper there. It's the only Coast Guard lighthouse that has an active resident lightkeeper out there. Cool. So if you walk the 76 spiral steps inside the lighthouse and the two ladders, you can get to the top of the lighthouse and get face to face with the giant lens on there, turn around and have a fantastic vista of the harbor and all the islands. Now I want you to take a look at how Boston Light looks today and I'm going to show you a drawing of what it looked like back in colonial days and you can see that it looked a little bit different and that's because of what happened during the revolution. So not only are the, har uh, the uh, Harbor Islands that are home to farms important strategic targets, so is Boston Light, obviously, because it controls the shipping into the harbor. So even after the battles at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill, the lighthouse is in the hands of the British. And on July 20th, 1775, the Patriots launch a nighttime raid from the South Shore. They land on Little Brewster Island. There is gunfire between the two sides. There are a few casualties. The Patriots burned down a little bit of the wooden structure of the lighthouse, but at the end of the night, the British were still in control of Boston Light. They send the next day for some laborers from the city to come out. They start the reconstruction work on Boston Light. Eleven days later, the Patriots are back again with another nighttime raid. More gunfire, more casualties. They burned down a little bit more of the lighthouse, but again, at the end of the night, it's still in British hands. And it remains that way until the British finally evacuate Boston. And as a part of gift to the citizens of Boston on their way out of town, they light a charge and they blow up what's left of Boston Light. And that's the end of that lighthouse that you see today. So the lighthouse that's out there today was built under uh, the orders of Governor John Hancock in the 1780s. So it is no longer the oldest lighthouse in the country. There's one that was built in New Jersey in the 1760s that has that designation. But Boston Light still retains the moniker being the oldest light station in the Coast Guard system. So that's why we, we are fortunate to have our light keeper out there. So if you were arriving by ship for centuries, as so many people did in the Boston, the Harbor Islands were the first piece of Boston you were going to see. It was the front door into Boston. Even today, if you land at Logan Airport, you look outside the cabin windows, oftentimes the Harbor Islands are the first piece of home that are going to greet you when you come back to the city. And uh, so... For centuries, when the ships arrive into Boston Harbor, the two biggest threats to public safety in Boston in its early centuries were, number one, enemy attack, and that's why I had the fortifications out there. Number two, it's uh, contagious diseases that might be brought in from foreign ports. So smallpox, yellow fever, those kind of contagious diseases were the big threat to public safety. So anytime a boat would come in from a foreign port, uh, uh, there were quarantine stations that were set up on the Harbor Islands beginning mm -hmm. in 1717. The doctor would go aboard, uh, check out the condition of the passengers on the boat. If there was anyone who had contagious disease, they might be taken off the boat to spend their time on the quarantine station until they recovered or unfortunately they passed away. So in the 1840s uh, is when the immigration to Boston really starts picking up because of the great hunger, the potato famine in Ireland. Uh, the city is flooded with um, refugees of the, from the Great Hunger. So in one year alone, 37,000 Irish uh, refugees come into Boston, a city of 150,000. Uh, the city is overwhelmed. The existing quarantine station at Rainsford Island was overwhelmed. They had to build a new one out on Deer Island to accommodate this flood of new immigrants. 
And unfortunately, a lot of the Irish who were suffering from the hunger back in Ireland, they're malnourished, they're weak, they may have just spent the last money they had just for passage on these boats, which many of them were not equipped for passenger traffic. They were actually boats that were used to transporting livestock. But they were used for these purposes to get the Irish to America. They were huddled, contagious diseases ran rampant all throughout these ships. In fact, they were called coffin ships because so many people would actually died in transit from Ireland to America. And uh, when uh, a ship arrived from Ireland, a lot of these Irish immigrants, Deer Island is the first piece of soil that they set foot on. And unfortunately for about 600 of them, it's also the last piece of soil, uh, American soil that they set foot on because they pass away inside uh, the quarantine station. But it's this connection between the Harbor Islands and the immigrant experience in America that leads to one of these what-if moments in history, and that has to deal with the Statue of Liberty. So you might remember uh, that the French sculptor Bartholdi gifted the statue uh, to America from France in the 1870s. And Bartholdi actually <coughs> visited different cities on the eastern seaboard to try to determine which place would be the best place to put the Statue of Liberty. And we all know in Boston that he made an egregious mistake by choosing New York to be the location <laughs> to put his statue. So the one stipulation uh, in giving New York the statue is that the statue is free, but you need to build the pedestal to put the statue on. So years go by, years go by, and New York has not raised the money or done anything to build the pedestal. So finally, in 1883, a group of Bostonians got together and said, well, you know, if New York's not going to build a pedestal, we'll build it right here to have the Statue of Liberty. Because, again, as we know in Boston, we're great at bringing construction projects on time and on budget, right? <laughs> So this was sort of the kick in the pants that New York needed because they couldn't believe that Boston would deign itself to be nearly as important as they are to have the Statue of Liberty in their harbor. Within three years, New York has raised the money, they've built the pedestal, and the Statue of Liberty is unveiled in New York Harbor in 1886. But just imagine if you were standing on the shoreline of Boston looking out into our harbor and seeing Lady Liberty staring right back at you, what a different uh, seascape it would be. All right, so the islands are the front door into Boston, but they're also Boston's backyard, a place where you're going to go play, but also maybe hide those things you don't want the neighbors to see. So over the centuries, the islands are home to city landfills, uh, factories. During the Gilded Age, Victorian uh, era in the 1800s, the islands are home to a number of institutions that people don't want to live next door to. Uh, the islands are the last piece of open land in Boston, so as the city starts to expand, people don't want to live next door to the prisons or the reformatories or the hospitals. They move all these institutions out onto the Harbor Islands. So along with the quarantine stations, you have these hospitals, you have, uh, you have prisons out there. All these different institutions to cure the physical and social ills of urban life. And if any of you ever read the book Shutter Island or saw the movie, uh, the book written by Dennis Lehane, it's no accident that Shutter Island was placed out in Boston Harbor because it fits right in with the history of it, although there was never any hospital for the criminally insane out on Boston Harbor. But to this day, the islands are still being used for social services programs. So Long Island, which is owned by the city of Boston, in the old hospital complex, there are 15 different social services programs going on there, including homeless shelters, uh, centers for battered spouses, people with uh, drug and alcohol addiction. So it, it's still being used for the, these purposes today. This magnificent Greek revival structure you're looking at out on Rainsford Island actually was the quarantine uh, station out there. It was used as the smallpox hospital. And when it wasn't, there were no active cases going on, Bostonians used it for another purpose too, where they had champagne and chowder parties. So you basically took anywhere you could go for some cool breezes out in Boston, even if it was the smallpox hospital to have your, uh, have your parties. Uh, unfortunately, this is all that's left of that structure. Uh, it was abandoned, and after it was abandoned, it went up in flames, and now it's just uh, some rubble that's out on the island. Now, if you are a lover of history, I would definitely recommend trying to get out to the Rainsford Island if you ever can, because the history is just surrounds you when you are out there. And literally, if you walk along the beaches, you will find old pipe stems, you will find Civil War era belt buckles, buffalo nickels, all these things that the harbor still holds, dredges up, brings in with the tide, 
Uh, some days it can look like the aftermath of a Greek wedding because there's just all the shattered china that is all over the beach. It's, it's uh, again, back from the time where people literally just threw their garbage right in the harbor and it's, it's still there and washes ashore. But underneath the cliffside where this hospital is, you will also find these inscriptions in the stone from pe previous residents of the island. Some of them date back to the 1600s, we think. Uh, may even be the namesake of the island, Edward Rainsford. And these are some finely etched inscriptions. Some of them are even in Latin. This one is notable because it was the man who made this one, Jerome Van Crownshield Smith, was not only the doctor on Rainsford Island in 1826, Two decades later, he was the mayor of the city of Boston. Um, Rainsford Island is not served by public ferries, but there's a great organization, a grassroots organization called the Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands, and they generally run two boat trips a year out to Rainsford Island with some very knowledgeable guides who take you around on the island. And if you ever get a chance to go, again, I, I highly recommend it. Now, we really don't think of it too much these days, but really for hundreds, if not thousands of years, the Harbor Islands have been home to people living in the Boston area. So the oldest artifact that has been found out on the Harbor Islands is about 8,000 years old. And it's thought that the first Native Americans who came to this area around 11,000 years ago, they lived seasonally out on the Harbor Islands. So they would fish from its shores, they'd harvest shellfish, and then they did some light agriculture out on the islands. When the Europeans arrived in the 1600s, they used the islands for very similar uses. So you have uh, fishermen and lobstermen who put up shacks on the island. There are the farms out there, as I mentioned. And we don't really imagine it these days, but during the Gilded Age, there were actually some fine mansions that were built out on the Boston Harbor Islands. And the finest of them all was called the Moorings. It was built out on Calf Island in the early 1900s uh, by Benjamin Cheney Jr., who was one of the richest men in Boston, and his wife, who was this woman, Julia Arthur, who was the queen of American stage, a well-known Shakespearean actress. And they poured their fortune into building the Moorings, which was a 12-room estate. Uh, it had eight servants there to do the upkeep on it. Uh, Benjamin Cheney would have his yacht uh, dock down below. He'd have a portico facing right back to the city of Boston. And Julia Arthur retired from the stage and spent many happy years out on the moorings until about 1914 or so, the Cheneys all of a sudden shocked Boston by declaring bankruptcy. All their possessions were put up for auction. The moorings is eventually taken over by eminent domain by the United States government with the start of World War I when Cap Island was put to military use. And unfortunately, what happened to the moorings is the same thing that happened to that hospital on Rainsford Island, is that it, after it was abandoned, it burned to the ground. And if you go out there today, this is all you're going to see is the foundation of the moorings and one lone chimney that was from Benjamin Cheney's billiard room. So mm -hmm. if you actually walk up to it, inlaid in white stone is a circle, and then the initials BP, which was for Benjamin P. Cheney. Uh, so that, is, uh, that was the end of the moorings. However, there is still an island out there where you will find people still living out during the summertime. That is on Pettix Island. And Pettix Island has an incredibly colorful history. Dates back, uh, the start of these summer cottages date back to the late 1880s when a group of Portuguese fishermen who lived on Long Island, their land was taken by, over by eminent domain. And rather than rebuilding their cottages, they actually took the cottages and they floated them across Boston Harbor and they landed them over on Pettix Island. And from there started the cottage colony out on Pettix Island. And it really flourished in the early 1900s. There were actually two hotels out on the Harbor Islands. And Pettix Island was a fantastic place to go if you wanted to engage in some nefarious activity away from the authorities in Boston. <laughs> so there were reports of opium parties going on in the hotels. During Prohibition, this was a great place for the rum runners to hide in the coves. They would actually do some home brewing in some of the cottages. Uh, even this quaint little cottage that you see here did double times as a brothel in the early 1900s connected with the island's ends. At its height, there was a uh, general store out on, the, out on Pettix Island, and uh, there was maybe three, 400 people living out there. And we were fortunate enough to get some great uh, personal photographs from a woman named Claire Hale from Georgetown. She and her husband actually uh, still go out there to the islands. Claire has been vacationing out there or living out there since she was six months old. Uh, 
And um, it's a reminder that we've been talking about a lot of the great moments in, in American history tonight, but these islands, we have to remember, also have a personal connection for so many people. Um, and that personal history is really reflected in some of these photographs we have. This one's my favorite. This is actually during, taken during World War II. Uh, you might notice the patch on these gentlemen's left arms. Those say Italy. These were Italian POWs who, after the fall of Mussolini, they were taken out to Pettix Island to spend uh, where they were kept at Fort Andrews. Uh, but on Sunday, they would get sponsor passes to meet up with families either in the North End or elsewhere in the Boston area where they could go have a, go to Sunday Mass, have a good Italian meal, and then they'd come back uh, to Fort Andrews, and during the week they'd work at the Constitution Navy Yard. Uh, and it's thought that after the war, as many as 50 of these men actually married women from the Boston area that they, they had met during their, their time in uh, Boston Harbor. Now, the fate of these summer cottages is unknown. Uh, the Commonwealth took over the island in the 1970s. It thought that having private cottages on public land would act cross purposes to each other. Uh, an agreement was come to about 15 years ago that the current cottagers can no longer pass along the rights to live in the cottages to anyone else in their family or next to kin if they pass away. Instead, the cottages are going into the possession of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, who unfortunately does not have the resources to do the proper upkeep that's needed for a lot of these cottages. So hopefully there'll be some way to preserve these cottages, because again, it's a colorful piece of the Harbor Islands history, but also a reminder of that personal history that, that's out there. Uh, Thompson Island is the education island of Boston. So in one way or another, there's been a school out there since the early 1830s. Uh, currently, it's owned by the Outward Bound Program. It's the only privately owned island out on the harbor. Uh, so now, youth from Boston will go out there. A lot of times during the school year, they bring kids from the Boston area out there to spend a week out there teaching them survival skills, team building exercises. They bring kids all over the country during the summertime. But this all started in the early 1830s with a farm and trade school that was out there. Uh, one of its claims to fame was that it supposedly home to the first school band of the country in the 1850s. Uh, six of the boys ended up graduating from the farm and trade school, ended up performing in the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And this photograph here is from a mock civics le lesson that the boys had. It was called Cottage Row. Going to a trade school, they obviously were pretty handy. They built their own structures out on the island. Uh, they built their own little city out there. They had their houses that they lived in, they had their own library. These boys were standing in front of City Hall. They elected their own mayor, their own police chief. They had their own form of kangaroo justice as well. Uh, one story we found was one of the boys was found guilty of harassing the school goat nanny. So he had to do 30 days of hard time of feeding and watering the goat for his uh, transgressions. Now the use of the islands that we know most of all today is for recreational purposes. And this really starts at, with the Industrial War Revolution when Bostonians have more leisure time, more money, and as the city fills up, the Harbor Islands are the closest place that you're going to be able to go to get away from it all. So the harbor uh, has been used for centuries for swimming, and in August uh, 1910, uh, Rose Pidnoff, who you see here, and seven men jumped into Boston Harbor right around the Constitution Navy Yard on an August day. And their goal that day was they were going to swim out to Boston Light. And that's a distance of about eight to ten miles. So it's a pretty grueling swim that they undertook. And one by one, as the afternoon progressed, all the men dropped out of the race. The only person that set foot on Little Brewster Island that day was Rose Pidnoff. And she did her swim in six hours and 50 minutes. Wow. Uh, and we think that Rose might have been the first woman to have ever done this swim. We think she might have been the first person to have done this swim. The previous year, there was a man from Austria who did the same swim, but he walked over the shoals of Nix's mate at low tide. So he wasn't swimming for the full time <laughs> he was uh, out there. Uh, and to cap it all off, Rose is 15 years old when she does this. Oh, wow. Afterwards, she does other long-distance swims in Europe, New York, and she uh, headlined a vaudeville show with swimming and diving tricks up at Revere Beach as well. And every year since Rose did this swim, there's been a Boston Light swim. It's now, I think this year, it's going to be somewhere around its 103rd edition. And, you know, we hear all the time about the marathon being an incredibly grueling sport, but the Boston Light Swim is right up there as well. Um, 
you have swimmers who uh, they have to navigate the current, the boat traffic that's out there. The water might be at best 62 degrees, even in August, and you're not allowed to wear any wetsuits while you're doing the swim. Uh, they start now at Boston Light. They swim into the L Street bathhouse in South Boston. And I told you that Rose did her swim in six hours and 50 minutes. The current record is, I think, about two hours and 40 minutes now uh, for doing this swim. But wow. it is an incredible uh, sporting event that you don't hear too much of. Uh, very quickly, Melville Garden in uh, Hingham was a Victorian era amusement park right on the harbor. So 10 steamships a day would leave Rose Wharf and take Bostonians out to uh, Melville Garden, which was on a property of a wealthy kerosene magnate named Samuel Downer. Uh, Samuel Downer, he went on a trip to Europe and fell in love with the German beer gardens which was a little strange since he didn't drink any alcohol whatsoever, so it must have been the pretzels, I guess. <laughs> but he spent a quarter million of his dollars to build his uh, amusement park on his own property, and he opened it up in the 1870s. So if you visited there, uh, there was uh, rowing in the harbor, swimming beach, you could play croquet. Uh, there was a all-you-can-eat Rhode Island clam baked for 50 cents. There was a dan dance hall um, uh, picture that you see here as well. Uh, if you had kids, there were Punch and Judy shows, monkeys, bears, and then at nighttime there was a fireworks show. But what really dazzled everyone was they would flip a switch and they'd turn on 10 electric lights. And for people, this oftentimes was the first time they'd ever seen electric lights uh, in person. Uh, I think what's really funny about this amusement park is I didn't notice it until a little bit ago, but you sort of see the mouse ears on this uh, poster <laughs> that they had here for. Uh, uh, Melville Garden, oh, yeah. sort of like a Disney World uh, mm -hmm. motif that they have. Cool. All right, so now was can I yeah, ask, sure. Was that uh, was that facility? I mean, were, was that little park thus out on the islands, or was it on on the mainland? It was on the mainland, except for Ragged Island, which was in Hingham Harbor, was part of the amusement park. So out on Ragged Island, that's its connection to the islands, they had some gazebos out there. So you would be able to row, rent a boat, you could row out in the harbor, you could row out to Ragged Island and uh, have a picnic out in the gazebos. And there are illustrations from the Victorian era books where you'll see women uh, in their full-length dresses and parasols and men dressed up you know, with their derby hats and their suits. Uh, you know, out for recreational purposes out on, mm -hmm. out on the Harbor Islands. Um, and Ragged Island is quite different today, so it's more ragged than it was back then. <laughs> Very overgrown with <laughs> thickets and everything, so you sort of have to walk along the outer edges of it. But back then, um, it was a, a, an island getaway connected with, with Melville Garden. So Spectacle Island, we didn't talk too much about tonight, but that, along with George's Island, is the main island that the visitors go out to now. Spectacle Island is an incredible story of rebirth. Uh, it, in the early 1900s, it's home to the city of Boston landfill. Uh, it was said that uh, the landfill was so foul out there that on foggy days, ship captains could still steer their way into Boston Harbor by just knowing which direction the stench was coming. Uh, and so when the landfill closed in the 1950s, you had this problem of what to do with Spectacle Island. And then along comes the big dig, and kind of the problem of what are we going to do with everything we dig up? Well, they solved the two problems at once. They took all the dirt and muck that they dug up from the, from the big dig, they took it by barge out to Spectacle Island, they completely buried the landfill that was there and re-sculpted the island. Uh, they increased its footprint, the height used to be the top height on the North Hill used to be 80 feet, it's now 157 feet, and they turned it into a parkland uh, after all this environmental rebirth. It opened about six, seven years ago. If you go out there, there are five miles of hiking trails, uh, there's a swimming beach that's out there, this is the view from the lifeguard stand, and um, a lot of open space. You can kayak on the, around the coves that, that are there, and now, ironically, it's the most environmentally friendly of all the islands. Everything's powered by solar power, all garbage taken on and off, everything's waterless uh, inside the restrooms there, so um, they've done an amazing job with transforming Spectral Island. There's a lot of programming that goes on there during the summer months, too, so if you go out there on weekends, you might find on George's Island Civil War encampments or
old-time baseball games using rules from the 1860s or children's play like this one. Spectacle Island, they have jazz concerts out on the big visitor center there. That's nice to sit in one of the Adirondack chairs that are shaded and listen to some music and, and see the views. And there's a lot of aquatic life that's coming back to the islands with the cleanup of the harbor about 20 years ago. So year by year, even lobster and shellfish are getting closer into Boston. So now you might see lobstermen right off of the, uh, the runways at Logan Airport. That's where the, the lobsters are getting closer back into the city. At low tide, you can wander around the tide pools and there's just a lot of aquatic life brimming inside. Um, it's great for sailing, great place to get away. Um, kayaks, too, are big out on the Harbor Islands. Uh, we try in the book to tell you where you can get offshore on each of the islands. Oftentimes, this might be the best you can do with some sort of rocky cove uh, on some of the more rugged islands uh, further out. Uh, the fish are biting, along with the cleanup of the harbor, so you'll find striper, codfish, bluefish uh, uh, out in, in the waters. Uh, there are more than 130 different species of birds that are out on the Harbor Islands as well. In the wintertime, they have special wildlife cruises, so you might see some porpoises or seals out there as well. This is Graves Light. This is the bookend to Boston Light. This was built in the early 1900s when they dredged the second entrance to Boston Harbor. So today, the big ships no longer have to try to thread that needle through the narrows. They'll go through the northern side of Boston Harbor. Uh, and when that was dredged, the lighthouse was built. It was recently put on the market by the United States government, and it sold a few months ago to uh, a local couple. One of the things they've been talking about doing is maybe converting this into a bed and breakfast. So if uh, that one bedroom inside might be available to, uh, for rent sometime in the next few years. And this last photograph, this is of Nix's mate. And this was that island that the Austrian swimmer supposedly did a little bit of walking on his swim out to Boston Light. And it's a cautionary tale for us about the Harbor Islands. Uh, when the Puritans arrived in 1630, Nix's Mate is a 14-acre island. It's used for grazing their sheep and their cattle. But the stones along the uh, coastline of the island were sold off by the colonists to be used as ballast for the ships. When they sold the rocks off, the islands lost their natural protection. And when that happened, the island started to erode into Boston Harbor. So by the time of the Revolution, Nix's Mate has shrunk to a six-acre island. By 1800, this is all that's left of Nix's Mate. Basically, have washed away into the harbor. Uh, at low tide, you'll see some of the shoals. But at high tide, all you'll sort of see is that pyramid beacon there. That's a symbol now for the friends of the Boston Harbor Islands because, uh, again, it's a symbol that these islands are not eternal. They still face threats from uh, rising sea levels, from man-made development. So part of what I hope to do is not only to get you guys to go out to the Boston Harbor Islands, but appreciate, as I said at the beginning, this resource that no other city in the country really has, and that we want to make sure that we're going to preserve this island, these islands uh, for generations to come to, to enjoy as well. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any, any questions that you might have about anything we've talked about. Yes? What is the state by um, the island with the cottages on it? Okay, so why the state by the island with the cottages on it? It was part of, uh, in the 1970s, the state started buying up some of these islands from private owners because they wanted to have this public parkland out there. Uh, so even though the cottagers, uh, they, the structures, they pay a nominal annual fee for, but the cottagers never owned the actual land that the cottages were on. So once the private owner of the island sold it to the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth had um, purchased the right to all the property on the island, not the physical structures themselves that, again, the, these cottages were, were paying the rent for. But uh, it was during that time in the 70s that they, the, the Commonwealth bought up about five or six other islands. So one thing about the 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 National Park area has sort of a unique governance structure in that the National Park Service does not own one acre of land out there. It plays an oversight role, an administrative role, and it provides no more than 25% of the funding uh, to the National Park area. Uh, the owners of the islands, the biggest owner is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but islands are also owned by the City of Boston, the Town of Hingham, uh, the Coast Guard, and uh, 
how we're bound, as I mentioned. So you have these variety of different owners that are involved in, in the management of, of the island. So um, prior to the National Park Area being established in 1996, the state had its own state park area of the Harbor Islands. So that's why we find them at that time. Yeah. yeah. Are there prohibitions for walking around any of the islands? If you have kayaks and you can somehow get onto them, will you get kicked off? There are periodic probation. So there are a couple islands that are off limits. One is Long Island uh, and Moon Island as well, both owned by the city of Boston. Moon Island is primarily used for the firing range for the police department and a training center for the firefighters. And Long Island has those social services programs uh, for confidentiality reasons, they keep that island off limits. So those two islands are off limits by the city of Boston. Gallup's Island, which had been open for years and years, was shuttered about 10 years ago uh, because environmental contamination asbestos was found out there. So there are warning signs everywhere around there that they want everyone to stay off that island. Uh, now some of the islands further out, they try to discourage visitation, uh, particularly during spring months where some islands might be used as rookeries, so there they, they try to keep people off, but they may not be posted. The best thing to do is always to go to the Harbor Islands website just to see, and they'll list island by island if there might be mm. off limits during particular times of the year. So unfortunately, we can't get out to all 34 of them, but for a good number of them, if you have kayak, you can get definitely get out to a majority of them. I was going, I was going to ask the uh, whether um, it was possible to access any of the, any of the islands via the ferry at hand. Yes. So the for years they've had a ferry on the south shore going from Quincy and Hingham. This year they have now closed down the ferry in Quincy uh, for all purposes. So there's no longer any ferries going out to Quincy. They're going to shift all that to to Hingham. So from the Hingham Shipyard uh, Marina. They have a ferry that goes on a loop from Hingham to Pettix Island and Grape Island and Bumpkin Island and George's Island. Um, so that does a loop from Boston, as I said, they you know you go right out to George's Island or Speckle Island. But at George's Island, you can get onto one of these other smaller ferries to go to some of these islands. So I so, think there's seven that are served by the public ferry. So in so if you went from Hingham. And you wanted to get the spectacle, for example. You I think you'd have. I think you'd have to. Ferry. I think you'd have to get off at George's and then board a, another ferry from George's yeah. to Spectacle. That's I think. Yeah. But they change the ferry routes every year, and now that Quincy's not going to be open, they might change it again this year. So it always changes every year. Yeah. They you, usually you, don't do, do you it. You know what the fare fare might be? In the past, it's been fourteen or fifteen dollars uh, for mm. uh, per person. Good. Every once in a while, they might run a half price offer on like Groupon or Travel Zoo, one of these these websites. Uh, There's well. one Friday during the summer that some organization has different things in Boston that are free, and one of them is George's Island. Yeah, and those uh, get there early. Oh you yeah, yeah. Be one of those because totally. They they send they sell out really early. And also another tip: if any of you are thinking of going to a Harbor Island on a weekend during the summertime. Best if you can to buy a ticket online beforehand. Um, it just saves you what could potentially be a long line at the ticket office, or potentially it might sell out. But you can go online, buy your tickets um, beforehand. That always saves a potential headache when you want to get to the to the dock as well. How many people go on the ferry? Like how many? I think 150. I think for the the main ferries that go out of Boston, I think there are about 150. They're they're a double decker ferry. Um, they're very much like the ones that they use for commuter purposes. The downstairs is has an enclosed area with a small snack bar. Up top is open air with, with benches. When you want to go to one of these other islands on the other loop ferry, uh, that boat is maybe about 40 person. It kind of looks like the Jungle Cruise at Disney World. You know, it's sort of got the canopy top uh, and you're sitting along the side. So every once in a while you might get a little splash of water uh, on you on the smaller ones. But the big ferries, uh, they're, they're, they're mammoth, uh, and you really don't even feel on a choppy day. Uh, are they handicapped the accessible now? Yes, I believe so. Because I a couple of years yeah. ago, and it wasn't been on George's Island. George's Island has done a lot of work in the last okay. two years. 
definitely check beforehand, oh, yeah. but they have been working on redoing the dock there too, so they might have it now so that, I know they've had a new gangway in the last couple of years, so you might be able to get off on that gangway uh, and have it handicap accessible. Definitely check, but I think yeah. that might have changed. Okay. Yeah. Just one other question. Why um, was that Grave Island light sold to private owners if the Commonwealth is trying to buy up all the islands? All right, well, so the Commonwealth did all, it bought it like 30 years ago, so the Commonwealth hasn't been putting a lot of money in recently to, okay. to doing this. Graveslight was a feder, it's, it was a federally owned property. So they've been doing with a lot of federal property, the federal government doesn't have the money to do the proper upkeep for it. And frankly, all that needs to be done is to give a tune up on the, the light that's, you know, everything's automated on it. So, it has been auctioning off various pieces of property all over the country. Graves Light was one of the local lighthouses uh, that they've done. But there have been dozens of lighthouses. This has sort of been the trend in recent years that governments are auctioning. They still have access rights to go in there and, and maintain the light. But for the physical structure, they're auctioning off to, to people. But people then have to put the investment in to make sure that these structures are being kept up to what leg is at the Peabody Museum that's, um, do you know what that is? No. Is it a lens from one of the um, yeah, lighthouses that's the in lighthouses. there? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. There are four lighthouses out on the islands now. Uh, Boston Light and Graves Light, which we saw. Uh, Deer Island Light is sort of, just looks like a matchstick. It's right out in the middle of, of the water. And at the head of Long Island, a small uh, lighthouse that's out there too. And there used to be other lighthouses that uh, were out in the Harbor Islands. One was called Bug Light because it kind of looked like a spider with its legs in the ground. That burned down about 80, 75 years ago. So there have been other uh, lighthouses now. There, there are four that are out there. Are there roads on these islands or is it just? On Moon Island and Long Island, which were the ones that are owned by the city and that are off limits, they have roads that are out there. Um, and uh, the ones where you're taking the ferries out to, there are paths, but no. Um, Paddock's Island has a few pathways that they can bring golf carts on and, and such. I should mention that there are actually four islands that you can drive to all year long. So Deer Island and Winthrop is attached to the mainland now. And same with these all these islands have been attached either by man filling in the, the harbor or just by erosion they're attached. But Deer Island on the North Shore and then on the South Shore there's World's End, Nut Island, and Webb Memorial State Park. So anytime during the year you can drive to these four islands to, um, to, to enjoy the park. Land. It's funny they, they still are. call them islands. I know. But it's like <laughs> Castle Island too. I mean, it's, it, you know, you figure when you go out to Castle Island the first time, how in the world is this? Yeah. Wow, but it was actually a mile off the shoreline originally and just tells you to what extent Bostonians changed the shape of the city by filling in everywhere from the Back Bay to uh, East Boston, South Boston. East Boston was actually islands when the Puritans came in. It was Nottles Island, another island called Hog Island, out where Logan Airport was, uh, is, was I think four other islands that basically got filled in to create more of the uh, more of the harbor. So if you look at an old colonial map of the Harbor Islands, it's really fascinating because the topography is completely different than, than what it is today. Is there still a prison out on the island? No. Uh, so the, the prison out on Deer Island was torn down in the, the 1990s for the construction of the wastewater treatment plant that's out there today. So if you see these giant egg-like structures that are out on Deer Island, that's the wastewater treatment plant. So um, everything on Deer Island has basically been bulldozed four or five times over over the centuries. So um, from that uh, quarantine station I told you about in the 1840s, there have been forts, there have been prisons, there were cemeteries out there. That, you know. They've moved all sorts of land out there, but now it's, it's basically dominated by this wastewater treatment plant uh, in the middle of the island, but there's two and a half miles of, of uh, paved uh, walkway along the perimeter that you can walk along and, and see all the sites. Uh, is that where the MWRA is? Yes. On yep. yep. Great, again, thank you for coming out. If you have any other questions.